Okay. We're going to start with the first part of uh, immunology. And uh, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, I did get the instructor's copy for uh, 2015 textbook. And uh, as we go along in this course, I would try to update that. But I, I think even if you don't, that's okay. But I would rather prefer that you use the new one because I did notice just for today's lecture, not major uh, changes, but I did notice that uh, you're going to find some changes. Extras in case you have any one that didn't use. Great. Anybody need a universal syllabus still? They'll be here in case you need them. And uh, as I move along, uh, I will post them and I'll let you know, and uh, we'll go from there. I did try to uh, post the podcast from the last year, but I think uh, Moodle cannot hold them because they're two humongous uh, files and take a lot of uh, free space. So I would want you to subscribe on uh, the private YouTube channel that's only for College of Pharmacy. And I've sent you a link so you can help yourself and see if you can uh, download them or wash them over there. But you have to have your own Gmail or YouTube account to do that. Okay, and since this is a uh, copyright issue, so we just want to have it on a private channel, not to be disseminated, copied, or put for general public use on YouTube. So be aware of that. Okay? And uh, I don't plan to change much of the information which was delivered last year. But uh, I would also try my best to make sure, because this is just the introductory course. Okay, that's interesting. We'll see all these issues uh, once we move on the third floor. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's begin with the immune system, uh, chapter one. And um, I usually uh, ask the students that uh, all the faculty and all the colleges of pharmacy across the nation try to pick up the textbook. And... Uh, okay, I don't... What to do with that? Huh? Microphone is on. So it is. I can turn it off. Okay. All right. So that's the reason. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah, I can't control it here. All right. So they wanted to give you an older one, 3041. The new ones are for P2, P3. So maybe they're having fun there. Anyway, so I would recommend that you buy that new book and read it. Because uh, uh, as I said this morning, when I was looking at uh, some of the concepts, um, they are rapidly changing. And as we were discussing uh, yesterday in the faculty meeting as well, that it's so unfortunate that whatever we teach you, uh, in these four years, by the time you graduate, everything becomes obsolete. So that's going to be a funny part, especially for rapidly advancing subjects like immunology. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, welcome to microbiology. Okay. And uh, this is my classical slide. Don't worry, I just kind of plagiarized. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, an overview of the immune system. If you look at the chapter, basically chapter one doesn't really talk much other than an overview. I'm going to talk about two important concepts, uh, innate and acquired immunity. That's what I used to say last year. But I noticed that uh, this year they want to switch over to call it adaptive uh, immunity. So innate and adaptive immunity, pretty much the same. Because, I, But I think that... Uh, the textbook wants to be with the general stream of the people, 
But if you were to be asked the difference between adapted and acquired, pretty much the same. But adapted probably is better word than acquired. I want to talk about clonal selection theory. I also talk about humoral and cellular immunity. And then again, we we'll talk about some of the diversity which is there in the immune response and what are the uh, pros and cons of that. Now remember, uh, immune system per se is a difference of words. Now immunity per se, English word immunity means just like I'm immune. You know, the president gets immune. You use these terms, uh, use that, hey, we cannot take him to the court of law because he is exempt from that, right? So that concept is from the immunist word Latin. And uh, the whole concept is that this particular immunity is there if you're normal to protect you from all that is non-self. That's something you have to understand the concept. Self versus non-self. So anything which is non-self is foreign to you. But also keep in mind, for example, if we are going to give you a drug, Tylenol, antibiotic. So what do you think of those drugs? Are they foreign or self? They're also foreign. So keep anything in mind. Anything that is introduced into your body, which is not yours, is foreign. And the body has to decide. One of the classical examples that we gave in this case, you can see from here, are of course microorganisms. So classical infection is invasion by microorganism, be it be it could be bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, or parts of them. And also keep in mind some of the other stuff that we normally consume, for example, food, is also foreign. That's why you must have heard people saying food allergies. Sometimes people pick food allergies. And we talked about any chemicals that are applied cosmetically, creams and lotions and anything, which is considered as a foreign, right? All the drugs are foreign. You live in an environment where you may have pollen, you may have animal hair, dander, so and so forth. So there's a system in your body that's going to recognize that and make a decision whether to react or not to react. Sometimes it overreacts, sometimes it underreacts. But nevertheless, it should be such that it should be a very benign, healthy, normal, orchestrated immune response to label you as normal. Okay? And then uh, we divide immunity uh, into two major classification, innate and adaptive. In my older slides, you'll see even on Moodle, uh, it will be acquired, but uh, just keep in mind, it's pretty much the same. So, innate and adaptive. Innate or acquired, pretty much the same thing. Now, what happens is that this is one immunity that each one of us is born with. Right? You, it, it, it is something which is already there, a part. You just like a cell phone, anything. So all these uh, operating system, which is in there in the cell phone, iPhone or Android, the system of operation is already there. You don't have, don't have to load an app on top of that. So if I was to give that example, the software that runs minimum operational needs of a cell phone, you are given free and it comes with the the cell phone and any other thing as needed, you know, depending upon how much memory you have on your cell and how much you prepared. So that's what the whole idea is in terms of innate immunity that you are born with. But also keep in mind uh, the basic concept that all the babies are born sterile. The, the environment in the womb of the mother in the uterus is non-infective. Even if the blood goes over, there's none that, nothing that goes to cause infection of the baby. The moment the baby comes in this world and takes the first breath, that's where, you know, the interaction with the ecosystem begins. But before that, everything is in it. Or the other word I would say hardwired is already there. You may not even know that. So it's always present. It's always available. And that is going to be the very first defense that you have in terms of fighting an infection, fighting an intrusion, fighting an invader, right? But also keep in mind that I'm talking about a normal baby. I'm talking about a normal, healthy baby. 
but babies may have problems. They may have some genetic disorders. They may have been born with a, a, a faulty system. Okay, so keep that your mind open that that could be a problem with innate immunity, but there is something called innate immunity. <coughs> uh, the simple example for innate immunity, remember when we talked about many of the system, I said, what is it that separates you from the environment? So environment is full of bacteria. If I was to ask you to culture this apparatus, your cell phone, your hand, your hair, any part of your body, if you culture it, you will see tons of bacteria there. Everything is infectious. There, there are tons of bacteria in the environment. They're always, always trying to get into us. That's the challenge that we have at all times. And that's the first challenge the baby has the day they were born. Okay, there's a fight that initiates over there between microorganisms and immune system right from the very first day. Okay, now, uh, the natural protection is skin and mucous membrane. So you are separated from the environment, from skin and mucous membrane. If anything is compromised, for example, there's a cut there, there's an ulcer there, there's a lesion there, so that physical barrier will be compromised and then you are prone or open to infection. Okay? Now, when I say immune system, I'm talking about two major players over here. Remember, I, I told you uh, in physiology, uh, we teach you uh, blood, for example. So blood has a liquid portion or cellular portion or a cellular portion and a cellular portion. In a cellular portion, there are, for example, we'll have uh, some of the stuffs like proteins, for example. But when we talk of immune system, we categorize these two again into cellular and acellular. And I'm going to use this term over and over again. If I was to ask you, what are the acellular components? They are chemical influences, pH, or fatty acids. So there's a pH of your mouth, of your body, and mucous membrane. And there is a pH of the skin, and there are some protective fatty acids on the screen. And they always are protective in terms of not allowing any microorganisms to invade. Okay, the moment you get a scratch, the chances are it's going to get infected. So you open the space. We'll, we already talked about complement system. That's the response for a cellular component. We sometimes get fever. That's also a response. These are very specified terms of immune system that we have in our bodies for protection. One of the things are interferons. And I, in pathophysiology, I told you gamma interferon. This is one of the cytokines released, a kinin released by the cells, which are protectors. Leukotrienes basically are substances released by the white cell, leuco. And then, as I said earlier, if I was to say, what is it that differentiates between self versus non-self? Right? So, they are very defined molecules. We call them in immunological determinants. This is like your ID number. At one level, I have access to your ID number. Right? At a higher level, not me, but people may have access to your SS number. So, there are multiple layers of identification. The chances are that the whole idea for security or a security breach or in terms of identification is that we are dealing with you and we want to go with multiple layers of recognition and multiple layers of security. It's just like you want to go and take money from your own bank, but they definitely are going to take you through a system. Okay. Now, uh, there is a, a, I really give an example for again, those patent pathophysiology, remember those uh, computer bars. So these are like those bars, that if you look at those bars, there are bars over here, there are bars everywhere. For an ordinary person, they all look alike. By looking at it, I cannot make out. But if you learn, run a scanner, scanner will say, oh, this is a pen, this is a pencil, this is such and such thing. So there is a pattern recognition uh, molecule on each and every part of your body, each and every cell. We call them uh, PRMs, right? We call it pattern recognition molecules. 
And one of the examples I gave you in pathophysiologies are TLR. What are TLR? Tall-like receptors. So there's a receptor, receptors there. It's just like the keys I have. They all are keys, but each one of them will open a different door. Okay? Then there are some serum proteins. We'll talk about in, in details. These serum proteins are there in the serum. And there are many of them, and many of them are tested when you get infected because the idea is either they're going to go up or down. Okay, for example, if you get infected, remember the cardinal signs of inflammation? One was fever, inflammation, pain, redness, swelling. So everything is again going to come in terms of immune response. That's your response of the immune system that we have. When we talk of cellular components, and uh, that's where we're going to go in very detail in this particular part of the course. Uh, I remember we talked about a phagocytic cell in pathophysiology called granulocytes, also called neutrophils. We talked about macrophages when we talked about M1, M2 macrophages. And we talk of many other connective tissue cells like microglial cells of central nervous system. So anything that is cell, keep in mind it would have a ID on top of that, right? And it's a very defined ID. And that's what we talk about in terms of cellular components. Now, a, a table in your book, I looked at it in the older version and newer version, there's not much of a difference. It's pretty much the same. The only difference is it's an inert and a quiet, no big deal. So if I was to ask you the differences between a inert, and you can see from here in terms of, uh, of course, property in terms of characteristics, in terms of the requirement that we have. The innate immune system is antigen non-specific. What it means is that each and every cell will an ID. I, I give you an example. Anti, it's called antigen determinant. Right? So this means I'm going to go and look at that ID. Now, we also know even bacteria and viruses will also have an ID. That's why we say gram-positive, gram-negative, staphylococcus aureus, ichorococcus granulosus, so and so forth. So this means if you are giving them a name, they have an ID, right? They have a shape, morphology. So that is where the innate system will respond to an antigen in a very non-specific way. What it means is it's going to fight regardless of what ID is there. You just say, hey, there are microorganisms, I'm going to fight them off. It's called non-specific. As compared to an adaptive immune response, we say it's adaptive. It comes after birth, where your system will ad adapt to the need. I give an example, like in special app. Hey, I want to do that function, I need that particular app. So that kind of an app, we call it antigen-specific, because it depends upon the need that you are loading that particular app for. Now for uh, the innate response is usually very rapid. It comes immediately because it's already there. You are born with. This is the first defense. As compared to adaptive, when a bacteria enters your body, you're going to fight it down specifically, but you want to be very specific in terms of how I need to put up a fight. So you have a planned fight with that. So that kind of planning comes with adaptation. That's why we call it adaptive immunity. For this one, uh, your system would not remember whether you have had an infection or not. But adaptive, yes. So if your system, for example, uh, let's say, give an example of uh, like a common cold, right? So if you get a common cold virus, right, which is a foreign to yourself, so your system will remember it because it goes and looks an ID. His, it says, you know, I'm going to be careful. This time this virus entered into me. Next time I'm going to put up a fight. Right? So you prepare ahead of time. You plan ahead of time. You adapt. So that's where adaptive immune response. So of course that's going to take, if you want to organize, and uh, put up a, a good fight, you have to take time. So there's a memory for that, okay? Now, we talked about natural barriers, and these are some of the cells 
in the body like phagocyte, natural killer cells, they are there randomly. They are just going to take hold of anybody, anything that causes problem without even asking for an ID. As compared to adaptive immune response, it's not going to do anything. It's going to first ask your ID and then see whether it recognizes you, have you entered the system before or not, and how best are we going to deal with you. It's just like give an example, if you have a fever, I'm, I give you Tylenol. Okay, so that's an inner response because I did not go and look for what caused the fever. Right, if I go back and look what caused fever, which was an injury on your hand, and you got infected, so I'm gonna give you Tylenol plus antibiotics. So that's more of an adaptive specific immunity as compared to general treatment. Does that make sense? Okay. And then there are other important things, but the most important thing you can see for adaptive immune response, we have very specific cells. And these cells are called lymphocytes, right? And I'm gonna discuss them in a while. And then again, very specific molecules they are going to fight, which are called antibodies. That's why some of the vaccination you are given is like an antibody. So you are uh, given a vaccination where we give you prepared antibody to fight future challenges of any infection. So we kind of help your body immunization. We'll talk about that in detail later. Now, as I just said, that uh, adaptive immunity, it comes late and in evolutionary terms, it's more of a program because we want to be very specific, we want to program you so that you are protected for it as compared to in it response. This kind of adaptive immunity is only present in vertebrate and uh, the major players in this kind of uh, immunity are B and T cells, okay? Now B and T cells are the major players over here in terms of adaptive immunity. If I was to ask you the cells of innate immunity, these are neutrophils. They could be macrophages, right? But these are the only two cells that carry that scanner. These are two cells that carry the scanner to, to, to identify the pattern recognition. Not all the cells will have that. Now, in order for them to expand, because remember, uh, it's just like, you know, one policeman gets hold of a person and he feels that there's need for me to call in much help. So he's gonna call in more people. So one T cell goes and finds a bacteria. Hey, I found a bacteria. I cannot handle it on myself. I'm gonna call other T cells to come for help. So this is what we call T cell expansion. That can only happen if you are in contact with an antigen. If you don't see an antigen and you start expanding, there's a problem there. You can always call in help when there is a need for help. So that's why we talk of control. Now, it is also called acquired, right? So this means that you have to earn it. This means that you have to be exposed to it, right? If you're not exposed to it, for example, if you were to say to me, I'm gonna get, I need you to vaccinate for me for next year flu shot, common cold shot. I cannot do that because that virus has not come yet. So the virus will come, we'll see the virus and prepare a shot for you. So all the flu shots that you get this year are nothing but a, a put up fight against the virus that caused infection last year. So we're only running one year behind, but it still is protective. Does that make sense? So that's what I'm talking about in terms of acquired. Uh, Edward Jenner, uh, Jenner, a British physician was the first one who discovered that in 18th century. And um, uh, I'm not going to go in detail, but you can read it on your own. At that time, there was a cowpox spread. And then he noticed that there were some milkmaids. They were milking those cows and they had protective immunity against the outbreak of another pox virus. So he kind of figured out that there's some kind of a protection that is conferred from these infected animals to, to, the, to the milkmaids, they were coming to milk them up, right? So that's where he came up with an idea of vaccination, that all the vaccination that you guys get, and all of us get, 
is coming from Edward Jenner's experiments because he was the first one in British physician who found out Vaca means cow. So he was the first to notice that that's where it was coming from. That's why uh, the concept of vaccination and immunization. But he was smart enough to pick up that there is something, prote he didn't know at that time, what is it that is causing protection? That you basically are protected from an infected animal to fight another disease. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, antigen compound induces acquirement. So also remember that, as I said, the drugs may have that foreign particle. That's why when we give you a drug, we want to make sure that you don't react to it. If you give me a drug and your system reacts to it, right, this means sensitivity, allergy. It may happen. But we want to make sure that it does not happen. So you don't go and have a problem with the drugs. The other concept I'm going to give to you, as I said, the ID of every cell. And just keep in mind, I'm going to use different words. Uh, there could be many determinants on your, on your body, on your, if you are a cell and there could be many determinants, each one of your cell, right? So what I would do, I would rather have, take a picture of your face and uh, try to identify that. Right? I mean, I can take the whole biometrics, but easier for me. So that particular uh, thing that causes reaction, we call that an antigen. Okay, so any particular thing, say, if I'm going to look at you and say, oh, you look sad, you look happy, you look, you know, depressed, whatever. So what I'm looking at is your face. So I can determine by looking at your face that something is happening in you. That makes sense? So likewise, there are many different markers on the cell. You have tons of markers on the cell. But uh, the most important thing is that uh, that particular compound, which of course is going to be chemical compound, that induces the immune response, right? So that response, you know, that you show in literary terms of being happy, sad, depressed, whatever, is exhibited on your face, right? So we, if I call that response as an immune response, IR, okay? So that is coming from that particular compound antigen, okay? And why do we need to call it antigen? because it is going to uh, invite a response, right? Which will be in terms of an antibody. So antigen and antibody. So these are gonna be fight with each other, antigen and antibody. It's like a mirror, does that make sense? So we use two terms, antigen and antibody, right? So if there is no antigen, there would not be any antibody. Does that make sense? So that's what it is. That's what the basis of uh, the whole idea is. So, but the immune response in terms means that we generate antibody and then we put up a fight. We see anything foreign, which is an antigen, we're gonna put up a fight, there's an antibody. So antigen and antibody are going to react, okay? So that reaction is called immune response. Now, uh, I gave you an example um, in terms of immunization, in terms of um, the, the immunization you had hepatitis B or you have childhood vaccinations and so on and so forth. There are three different types of immunization. One is called active immunization, one is called passive, one is called adaptive immunization. Very easy to understand. The baby is just born, right? And... Uh, she doesn't have infection from measles, mumps, or rubella, for example. These are three viruses. So what we do is we give a very small dose of, a, of this virus, of measles, mumps, and, and rubella, as an antigen, right, to the baby. So we basically are causing infection to the baby, not strong enough to cause disease, but to show the immune system, hey, you were just born into this world, and these are three important viruses that are dangerous for you. You better get prepared. Educate your immune system. Teach your immune system. Make antibodies against these three. 
If we do that, which we do, we call it active immunization. Now remember, if I was to ask you if the baby is already suffering for some reason for an area in Sahara, Western Africa, or any part of the world, uh, she gets measles. And she was never vaccinated for M. Do we still need to give her a vaccine? No. no. Because she already now has, she may expire in the process of fighting the infection, which normally used to happen. But now the system already learns it the hard way. We don't want the babies to learn the hard way by getting infection. We would rather teach the immune system, hey, these are three problems and more than that, right? So if you do that, which we do, is called active immunization. We administer, administer an antigen. We may not give the whole virus. We just give a part of that virus that's strong enough to provoke an antibody response. Right? We'll all discuss that in detail later. Now, let's say, uh, for example, if a person gets tetanus, right? You just had you just had a roadside accident, so this means that there's a chances that you may have had tetanus clostridium tetani in your body. Should we give you an active vaccination now? No, because you've already been exposed to that. Right? So now we need to help you out. So now what we will do is, instead of giving you an antigen, we will give you an antibodies, which we have already prepared in another animal model. Because we don't want to wait for antibodies to be produced because as a part of adaptive immunity, it's going to take a while and you may get infected right now and it kill you. So if you do that kind of a thing, it's called passive. So we already, it's just like, hey, I'm going to give you all this food. You cook your own food or I'll give you cooked food. So if you give you cooked food, you just have to eat. So antibodies like prepared antibodies. That's what they normally do as a routine. Adaptive immunization, uh, a little bit complicated. I'll discuss that when I tell you cancer. But what we do is that we have very specific cells that fight cancer. Right? So we either take it from you educate these cells, prepare them, and harness them to fight a cancer and put it back in you. So that's the latest concept we have in terms of adoptive immunization, where we give you your own cells or uh, competent cells to fight uh, cancers and so on and so forth. So these are three major types of immunization we have. I talked about adaptive immune response, so why is it uh, acquired? But there are some very specific characteristics, right? Adaptive immune response. I just give an example for MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. We're given to, uh, to the babies because these are very specific. So they really go for an ID and mount a very specific. So it is their ability to, this, so this means if I give you MMR, so you're going to make three types of antibodies. Each of them will fight a particular virus. So very specific. You know, it's only designed for you. It's, it's complementary. Okay? That's what we say, specificity. So if, I, if you get a roadside accident, if I give you antibodies, I don't give you any antibodies. I give you antibodies against Clostridium tetani. So that's specificity. This is the term we use, specificity. The other thing is adaptiveness. This means that uh, our body has this capability of identifying, you know, one T cell that we have in our body can pick up at least 100,000 different antigen. It has this capability. It carries the data on itself. It looks at when the antigen is going to run 100,000 different markers to identify you. And it may not look much to you, but remember, all English is a 26 alphabets. Everything you see, libraries are full. And, uh, you know, all come from that. Hold on till I end. Yeah. Now, uh, <clears throat> discrimination between self versus non self So this means that's another very important adaptive immune response that you want to make sure. If I make an antibody, for example, to fight an infection, I want to make sure that that antibody doesn't start killing me, right? It should not be a friendly fire. You make something, right? And you turn the gun around. That should not happen, but it may happen. 
Okay, that's where we'll, we'll, we'll discuss diseases. We'll talk about that. That's we've got discrimination between cell versus non-self. And then again, memory. So this means that uh, once you are you once you get an infection, for example, measles, your grandmother will say, hey, my child had measles. So she would tell you, yeah, she had this baby had measles. So she would get lifelong immunity, never to get measles again, because the antibodies are good enough for life. So that capability of the immune cells to recognize and store your ID into the system is called memory. So we have that. Okay, so that's also a part of adaptive immune response. And then again, uh, what, are, what are the details for that? We'll have to read the whole book, but I'll try to explain that to you as we move along, how and why, and what are the determinants for that. Now, uh, I just gave you an idea that uh, this concept of cellular immunology just started in 1950s. So you can imagine everything is not that far apart. You know, when we were medical students, people used to kind of ignore immunology. Who's going to care about immunology? It sounded like French to us. But then we realized that every Nobel Prize in medicine is going to go to immunologists. Every change that's going to come in is the immune system. Because unless and until we know how the immune system reacts, how are we going to give drugs? We need to know what is there. So the two important cells of immune system are B and T cells. There's another cell we discussed earlier as well. It's called antigen presenting cell. We'll discuss that in detail. Major histocompatibility gene. That is the tissue typing. And then the whole concept for immune system we call cognate. Cognate means the cell has to come physically in contact with the other cell to mount a response. So that's a cognate system. So cells have to kind of digitate or kind of touch each other. That's a cognate system we call interaction. Some of the cells are there in both innate and adaptive immune response, beautiful mast cells and so on and so forth. They are non-specific, so we'll discuss as we move along. The important thing that you have to keep in mind is that uh, what is it that is going on in our body? How does body recognize that? What is it that is happening? How the system is designed for recognition of each and every cell? Now, you have to keep in mind that there are T cells in the body, right? And these T cells will circulate in your system within 72 hours. They want to make sure and travel to each and every cell and make sure the cells in your brain, cells in your heart, in your eyes, gonads, everything is nothing but you. They will run a check within 72 hours. So that is an important concept that I'm going to discuss today, uh, we call clonal selection theory. The guy was given a Nobel Prize in 1950. Uh, but you have to understand the concept. So these are very specific T and C cell specificity. I'll talk about uh, B cell receptor, T cell receptor. In the next slide, probably those of you who are visual will have an idea as to what is happening in our cells. Now, no, we know for sure the T cells. Where do T cells develop in the intrauterine life? Thymus. They are developed in thymus. Okay, good. So you can see that there is a stem cell in the body, and then this stem cell divides into different cells. So two important cells type they will develop are B and T cells. Now, anything can go wrong, right? There could be something which will be some of the cells may react to your own self. Because there could be mutation, there could be errors, right? So some of the cells may react to your own tissues. So we need to remove them. Guess what? If you don't remove them and they stay into the system, what will happen? If they stay in your body, that they recognize your own self as non-self, what will happen? <laughs> autoimmune diseases. Basis of autoimmune diseases. Basis of autoimmune diseases. Now, these, these are B cells. These B cells are the ones that produce antibodies. So you can see that they have this ability to make sure that they don't react with self, but they may react. Remember we talked about those antibodies in myasthenia gravis, 
against you know the uh, the uh, acetylcholine receptors in in the so that's where they bind the self and they cause problems so in in terms of disease we don't want that to happen so this particular area where our body removes those self reactive cells are very important if they do not then you will start killing yourself and which you do and that's the basis of autoimmune diseases okay now there's another term that we use uh, uh, especially for adaptive immune response so in it adaptive adaptive is divided into two we call humoral humoral means where we talk about antibodies which are non cells and cellular as the name suggests is cellular right and we'll talk about these things, immunoglobulin and complement system in each and every chapter. But this is how a, a antibody looks like. You can see it has a heavy chains. It's like, like me standing over here, and these are like my light chains to head, right? And my legs are like heavy chains. And I can bind to an antigen with my hands over here. So that's what an antibody is. It's an antigen binding site. This is how it looks like, you know, in cartoon, but of course not that simple. In cells, uh, as I just told you, that the T cells have an ability. Let me go to the next one to give you an idea. So you can see from here, uh, this is a B cell, and they are T cells. Both are lymphocytes, but they are called B and T cells because the determinants are different. You must have heard of CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells. Now you can see from here, B cell has antibodies attached to the outer surface, whereas T cell does not have that. The T cell has, we call T cell receptor. It has those kind of hands, you know, multiple hands over there to identify. And these, both of these, in this case, the hands for the B cell are these two. And over here, these are the specific hands that we have in terms of recognition of cells. Now, there are tons of function associated with the T cells. We'll talk about these in detail, but I'm just giving you a very overview because of the first lecture. The T cells may have a, one of the help we call, if they have B cell, we call them helper cells. They have inflammatory effect. They have ability to kill other cells, called cytotoxic cells. And they have this ability to produce those leukotrienes and immunoglobulins, those chemical compounds um, we call cytokines, okay? Now, uh, the last concept before I finish in a couple of minutes is that uh, there are hundreds and thousands of different antigens. Each and every morsel of the food that you take, each and, each and every cloth that you wear, anything that is chemical in nature has an ID there, and your system wants to identify that. Right? So we call that as antigen specificity. And these are basically uh, here in the body. And they, the B and T cells have the ability to take their genes and identify them and hold them. So they will have, if I have like 100,000 receptors, and if this is one antigen, I'll pick up the corresponding receptor and just shake my hand with only one receptor out of 100,000. So you can see this is a beauty of a very specific response. That's the basis of immunization. That's why you pretty much take care of some of the infectious diseases. And then again, uh, the other important thing that again got people Nobel Prize was production of these antibodies. So they kind of make out that they have this ability. So in the previous slide, may look to you like a same antibody, but no, the same antibody. I will give an example. Like my, I can have hundreds of different colors of gloves. So antibodies have these gloves they put on, which is very specific for each and every uh, antigen that they come across, okay? There are a lot of benefits of immunology. You can see practical applications. Polio has been terminated. We talk about transplantation, cancer, AIDS, right? We only vaccinated human beings. There was a very high mortality rate in the kids before we had the childhood vaccination. That's been saved. Um, livestock we vaccinate. Um, we have this smallpox eliminated. We have immunoprophylaxis and many more other things that are happening in terms of uh, the practical uses of the uh, immunology. But again, we have problems as well. So if the immune response is not well orchestrated, is out of control, you get tissue damage. That's pathology. That's why you got allergies. 
we call hypersensitivity. You got artery immunity, you got AIDS. All these because your immune system is messed up, right? So we wanna help your immune system by firstly knowing what exactly is there, okay? And then again, there are many different things which are coming up in the future of immunology. One of the most important thing is we are still trying to develop vaccines. We are, have bioinformatics, we have DNA vaccines, and many other things which are coming in the market. And uh, those of you who are gonna be, uh, stay competitive, those of you who wanna be a part of R&D, and want of you, those of you who want to understand the, uh, the basis of the immune system, they would really have to make sure that they understand cellular biology, a little bit of genetics, and, uh, and at least the, the basis of uh, the immunology. 